I don't want to hear anything about, I don't believe in vampires. Because I don't f***ing believe in vampires. But I believe in my own two eyes. And what I saw is f***ing vampires. Now, do we all agree that what we are dealing with is vampires? Welcome once again, my fellow manipulators of digital fate. I'm Richie, this is Capricorn, and I'm finally out of the woods. I'm feeling way better. I'm not completely healthy yet. I have a little bit of a cough, but my energy's back. I'm ready to hit the ground running. I'm ready to bring you guys the crazy standard brews for foundations. Uh, and honestly, I have so many decks lined up and things are looking crazy. This one in particular is called Eternal Dusk. And the idea is we're diving deep into life gain again because life gain decks are insane right now. There's an embarrassment of riches with insanely good cards. Honestly, it's hard to try and fit everything that wants to be in this deck into this deck. So I've, I mentioned this a couple times in the deck tech that we're going to get to in just a minute, but... There are going to be multiple versions of life gain decks because there's just too many good cards uh, and too many ways of sort of building around this this archetype. So expect more decks. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Expect more decks in the future. Uh, life gain's just looking absurd. You'll you'll see when we get to the gameplay. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to break down the deck. Quickly like the video if you wouldn't mind. I was out sick with pneumonia for a week, and I am battling hard to take back uh, the algorithm, which hates me right now. A lot of you guys went out of your way to like yesterday's video and leave comments, and that means a lot. Honestly, the more likes and the more comments we get on the video helps the channel so much. Getting the good graces of the algorithm helps the, the videos get pushed out to so many more people. And we need that really bad right now because we went a week without content. Um, and the algorithm hates us. And it, we're going to be paddling upstream. So every like, every comment matters so much more right now than it ever has. So if you could do me a favor, smash the like button. And if you're new here, make sure you subscribe because tons of crazy deck techs on the way. Uh, yeah, there's there's lots of stuff coming, but we're going to get right to the deck tech. We're going to break down the deck. Catch me live Monday through Friday over on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash quarantine Capricorn because if I'm alive and I'm breathing, I'm there and I'm streaming. <sighs> now let's break down the deck. All right, so life gain decks are looking absolutely insane now that Foundations is legal and standard. And honestly, there are an embarrassment of riches when it comes to really crazy, awesome life gain enablers and life gain payoffs in standard right now. To the point where it's hard to fit all of the amazing cards in the same deck. And it's really difficult to make choices about what to include and what to cut. So... I would not be surprised if I iterate on this in the future and make a bunch of different versions of life gain because there's just so many different ways you can build it, so much you can do right now. But this version is trying to sort of lay the groundwork with some really cheap foundational cards, pardon the pun, uh, that, that sort of build out the, the early curve. We're trying to keep things as cheap as possible. Um, and we're utilizing some new cards that really kind of hit home. Um, the one thing I do want to point out right at the start here is we're using Enduring Innocence as a 4 of. Uh, 3 mana for a 2-1 lifelinking enchantment creature that when it dies comes back as a non-creature version of the enchantment. And this allows us to draw a card once a turn whenever a creature with power 2 or less enters. So almost all of our creatures, the 2 drops and the 1 drops, all have 2 power. They come in, a lot of them grow and get even bigger over time, but they come in as 2 power creatures and allow us to draw off this. And at the same time, this is a lifelinking creature that allows us to get life gain triggers and fuel all of our synergies. So... We're sort of basing this version of life gain around the fact that we get a lot more value off of things that have two power or less when they're first entering the battlefield. Um, and sort of kind of trying to leverage that a little bit more. We are using a bunch of new cards that are really amazing. And I want to go over those first of all. We have Exemplar of Light. We're running just one copy of this because it's too good not to include it all. But... Like I said, we are trying to stick to the lower curve stuff as much as possible so that we can get as much value out of Enduring Innocence as possible. So we're going to go with just one. 
but I wouldn't be surprised if future versions of this deck saw us using multiple copies of this card. Uh, it just kind of has to be built slightly different to make this card uh, good enough to see play at 4 mana. But a 3-3 Flying Angel for 4, whenever you gain life, you put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on this creature. So it's an Ajani's Pride Mate that has flying, that starts off a little bit bigger, but costs 4 to come down. But the real power of this card comes in the last line of text. Whenever you put one or more plus one plus one counters on this creature, you draw a card, but this ability triggers only once a turn. So a nice way to get a get extra value off of off of all of our life gain triggers. Well not all of them, but at least one a turn. Um, and we're not limited to getting just one plus one plus one counter a turn. Just like a Johnny's Pride Mate, this will keep getting counters for every single life gain trigger that we have. It'll just only draw us a card once a turn. So if we do have a way to gain a little bit of life on our opponent's turn, we can actually draw more cards off of this, draw two cards every turn cycle. And this card's actually really, really good. I can't wait to brew more with it in the future. But for this deck in particular, since it is a four drop, since it starts with three power, we are only using one copy. We're also using one copy of Alenda Saint of Dusk, and if there was any card in this entire deck that deserves to be considered as at least a three of, uh, it's probably Alenda here. So I'm absolutely going to be brewing new versions around Alenda that use more copies of this in the future as well. This is a 4-4 Legendary Vampire Knight for four mana in the colors of Orzhov. It has lifelink, and the most important part is it has hexproof from instance. That's not saying it has hexproof from things they cast at instant speed, just hexproof from instance. But the thing is, the current standard meta right now, there's so much prowess, there's so much mono red prowess going around that you kind of have to have your removal suite be almost all instance. So that hexproof from instance kind of reads like just hexproof, which is an ins insane. Even if they you know, wanted to wait until their turn and cast removal at sorcery speed to kill Alenda, they still have to actually cast a sorcery. If it's an instant, it still can't target Alenda regardless of when you're playing it. So, she's just insane as a 4-4 lifelinker that's almost unkillable uh, with most of the removal that's being used in the standard meta right now. But then as long as your life total is greater than your starting life total, she gets plus one plus one in Menace, so she becomes a 5-5 lifelinking Menace creature if you're just at 21 life or more, which is nuts. And since she has lifelink herself, she can enable herself and turn that on, but then if she gets, uh, if you get up to at least 30 life or more, she gets a plus five plus five bonus as well, and that stacks with the original plus one plus one in Menace, so if you get, <coughs> excuse me, still getting over being sick. If you get to 30 life, <coughs> <coughs> damn, ugh, if you get to 30 life or more, she becomes a 10-10 lifelinking menace creature that's almost indestructible because of the hexproof, which is just insane, this card is nuts, and honestly that hexproof from instance is way more powerful than it seems on the surface, it makes this card insane, but again, for the same reason we only ran one exemplar of light, we're only going to run one Alenda in this deck because we are trying to stick to a lower curve, those smaller creatures, to get the absolute most draw potential out of Enduring Innocence. So one copy of Alenda. We're also running two copies of A. Lee Eternal Pilgrim. Another new card, or I believe it might be a reprint. Let me know in the comments. Uh, this one does come into play with two powers, so we're going to run multiple copies. And I would honestly consider running three copies of this if there weren't so many amazing cards that want to be in this deck that is hard to make cuts. But we are going to run the two copies. This comes in as a 2-3 Death Toucher for two mana. You can pay one, sack another creature to gain life equal to the sacrifice creature's toughness. This is really good to get our triggers that we need if we're in a pinch. We're not usually going to use that ability, but it's kind of a plan B backup ability that can get us our life triggers if we're in a pinch. Um, and get us, you know, to where we need to be life total wise to turn on some of our synergies. But the real re reason we're using this is because if we get to that key 30 life, kind of like we need for Alenda, we turn on this other ability for Ailey where we can pay 3 mana, sack another creature, and exile any non-land permanent. And this deck has ways of bringing our creatures back from the graveyard under certain circumstances or ways to retain value when sacrificing a creature, such as Enduring Innocence just coming back as a non-creature version of the card when it goes away. So, being able to sacrifice some of our creatures to get rid of their problematic permanents are insane. 
Uh, that That's insane. And the fact that we don't have to just hit creatures with this, we can exile literally any non-land permanent makes it kind of insane. So the more consistently we can get to 30 life, the better Ailey is in a deck. And I think this deck does a good job of getting there. And Ailey is absolutely nuts as, you know, an auxiliary sort of uh, removal engine within the deck. The Death Touch is also super helpful. It helps shut down certain aggressive plays by the opponent, which is really nice. Now, let's talk about the curve. We'll start at the bottom. We've got four new cards. Uh, Hinterland Sanctifier in the one-drop slot. This is a 1-2 Rabbit Cleric, and whenever another creature you control enters, you gain one life. It's really important to have these life gain triggers stack and to have them the cost the least amount possible. There's a lot of cards in standard right now you can choose from that will get you this gain one life when a creature enters trigger, um, but no, none of them cost one. This is the one creature that has that ability that costs one. It came to us new in Foundations. And it has some added value in that it is both Rabbit and a Cleric, which is going to matter with some of the synergies coming up. So this is an absolute must, for, must of four of, in my opinion. We've also got four Case of the Uneaten Feast to go along alongside it. So most of the time we're trying to play one of these one drops on one that's going to start just steamrolling our life gain triggers every single turn after that. And it's hugely important that we make those, you know, one mana turn one plays um, as consistently as possible, so we are actually trying to keep the mana base as untap heavy as possible to make sure we're always able to kind of play these on one. We've also got two joust through for one mana at instant speed. I actually think this card is really good for life gain decks in particular. <coughs> it deals three damage to an attacking or blocking creature, and then we gain a life at instant speed. Now. Obviously, the hoop of having to jump through targeting only an attacking or blocking creature is kind of a bummer, but the fact that we can Lightning Bolt an opponent's creature for the same amount of mana as a Lightning Bolt and also gain one life, and even though that one life is kind of negligible, only being one life, we don't really care about how much life we're gaining. This triggers all of our life gain synergies. It counts as a life gain trigger, and that's what's huge here. We're able to kill something at instant speed for one mana and get a life gain trigger in the process, which I think at least makes this worth experimenting with. So we're running two copies to go alongside our other four pieces of removal to kind of make a six piece removal package, a six card removal package in the deck. And those other four pieces of removal are Sheltered by Ghosts. This card's insane. Two mana, exiles whatever we want, gives our creature ward two, gives it plus one attack, gives it life link so we can get even more life gain triggers. Uh, it is a little bit risk reward, but I think this card has ways to get value off the tempo advantage where even if they kill the thing that Sheltered by Ghosts is on, we've gotten so much tempo advantage over the course of the game uh, in the couple of turns that we managed to stick it uh, that it ends up being worth it and we don't really care. This is the absolute perfect removal card for a deck like this where the lifelink is going to matter that much more. We're also running four Essence Channelers, the absolute, absolute best standard version of a Johnny Pride made available. Absolutely going to run it. Absolutely amazing. I say absolutely a lot. Deep Cavern Bat, two mana for a 1-1 Flying Lifelink, gets their problematic cards out of their hand, hits their removal, must include card here, uh, and the Lifelink is even better in this deck than it is in other decks because it's going to trigger all of our Lifelink synergies, it's going to put counters on that Essence Channeler, super super good. We've got two Amalia Benavides Aguare to go alongside our four Essence Channelers to give us our six sort of a Johnny's Pride Mate style cards. This one's really good because they have to pay life if they want to get rid of it, and it can dig and find our lands uh, and then pile up counters on itself. Um, it kind of just does everything we want to do. And then we've also got two Ellis Ill cores to go with our four Hinterland Sanctifiers and four Case of the Uneaten Feasts as another couple cards that can gain us life whenever a creature enters, except this one is also a really good roadblock against mid-range decks because it's a death touch creature that can stop one of their big threats. And when our creatures die, we're going to ping the opponent for a point of damage every time, so it's also a little bit of supplemental uh, win con kind of packed in. <coughs> Excuse me. I think LS Ilkor is a super important part of the deck. It is legendary though, so we're just going to run the two. And then the three drop slot, we've already talked about 
the uh, four copies of Enduring Innocence, which is able to draw us a ton of cards off of all of these two drop creatures and the Hinterland Sanctifiers, which is utterly insane. Uh, but like that lifelink's gonna draw us, draw us cards off of certain things and get us life gain triggers and all that good stuff too. So super good card in this deck. We're running one copy of Zorline. We have some bat synergies so that we can gain life when bats attack because we have essence channelers and deep cavern bats. Uh, it's also super relevant in that it can bring stuff back from the graveyard for two mana every turn. So if they've you know used up all their removal on all of our other creatures, this is a way for us to bring back creatures. It's a way for us to bring back something we sacrifice to an Ailey um, and get that engine kind of popping off. So it is legendary and it doesn't have two power to draw cards off of Enduring Innocence. So we're just gonna stick with one copy here, but I think it's absolutely worth the slot and I wouldn't fault you if you went up to two on it, to be honest. And then we've got one copy of Enduring Tenacity. And this is a card where in playing the deck, I actually am not sure if it's worth making room for this card in the deck, uh, which is crazy to me because this is such a good life gain payoff. But like I was saying at the beginning of the deck pack, deck tech here, uh, it's just so hard to fit everything that wants to be in this deck into the same deck. And I think sort of doubling down on all of the two power creatures, all of the cheaper creatures that can get us a lot of value because they get us even more value off of the Enduring Innocences makes sense for this version of the deck. That being said, we are still running one copy of Enduring Tenacity. Under the right circumstances, it can help us just close out the game. It's something we can sacrifice to Ailey or whatever uh, and still have it come back and give us value after we sack it. So I think it's worth running the one copy. But I do want to note that the one Enduring Tenacity, the one Exemplar of Light, and the one Alenda Saint of Dusk, those are the only three four drops in the whole deck. And I wouldn't fault you for wanting to choose one of those and doing three copies of them instead of one copy of each. Uh, sort of using this as an opportunity to test those cards and figure out which one is actually best in the deck. But in this version of the deck, it honestly might just be uh, rational to kind of cut those cards and focus on the things that can trigger the Enduring Innocence. And maybe the Enduring Tenacity Exemplar of Light and Alenda just want to be in a completely different kind of life gain deck. I'm not really sure. But, <coughs> excuse me, I am really enjoying all of those cards. They pop off whenever they hit the battlefield, and there will absolutely be more brews in the future using those cards, especially the new ones, Exemplar and Alenda. Absolutely nuts when you get them when you get them popping off. So this is the deck. The mana base is very specific. We're able to run three mud flat villages because we have enough bats uh, to, to make it worth getting things back out of the graveyard, like Essence Channeler, Deep Cavern Bat, Zorline. We're running one Lupin Flower Village. We mostly need our white mana to be able to be used for things that are non-creatures, so we don't want to go too crazy on the Lupin Flower Village. But I think it's worth running the one. We can use it to find those same bats I already labeled, but we can also use it to find a Hinterland Sanctifier, which uh, makes it way more consistent than it otherwise would be. Four Caves of Koilos and four Concealed Courtyards because we want as many untapped lands in the first three turns as possible. Like I said, we want to make sure we get those uh, one drops down on turn one so we can start steamrolling that, that advantage off of those life gain triggers immediately. So we want to try to shy away from having to play a tap land on turn one if possible. Uh, we are running one Restless Fortress though, because if we get that one Restless Fortress into play, sometimes the fact that this can turn into a creature and swing and get us a life gain trigger in the process matters in a deck that has so many ways to get value off of life gain triggers. And speaking of life gain triggers, we're going to run four copies of Scoured Barons. These are the only other tap lands in the whole deck. Uh, and we wouldn't run them except they're a free way for us to get a life gain trigger, which sometimes makes all the difference in the world. And since we have so many two drops, there's so many situations we can be in where on turn three, we're going to play another two drop and we don't necessarily mind jamming a Scoured Barons out as a tap land that turn and getting an extra life gain trigger when maybe we don't have a one drop to play beside our two drop anyway. So we are going to include the four Scoured Barons and the one Restless Fortress, but those are the only tapped lands because like I said, we want to make sure we're consistently playing a one, one drop on one and curving out after that. We don't want to be held back by tap lands. We're running one Cavern of Souls, 
usually naming cleric um, but depending on the situation if we're desperate we can name different types of creature types like bat um, this just gives us a little bit of extra value against control decks that might want to try to counter our stuff we've got one murex this is a way later in the game for us to spit out a creature every single turn and get some of those life gain triggers off of the creatures we have in the deck that allow us to gain life whenever a creature comes into play, uh, enters the battlefield, whatever. <coughs> and then one Thrawn Portal. And the main reason we're playing Thrawn Portal is to be a basically a fifth copy of Caves of Koilos because we do want consistently access to the ability to ping ourselves for one damage because we have some synergy with Essence Channeler where if we have taken damage this turn, it's going to get Vigilance and Flying until end of turn, which sometimes can hugely matter, especially against aggro decks. If we're able to swing in and still hold the Essence Channeler up as a blocker against aggro, sometimes that can make all the difference in the world in keeping them from killing us while also shortening the clock and killing them quick enough. And sometimes the Flying really makes sense as well to swing past their ground forces. So. Being able to consistently have the ability to turn that on, <coughs> excuse me, with the four Caves of Koilos and the one Thrawn Portal sort of as like a fifth Caves of Koilos, I think is important, and it's worth adding that one Thrawn Portal to make that happen. So that's the deck. Honestly, life gain is poised to be really insane in the meta right now. And uh, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let the uh, the deck speak for itself, and I'm gonna shut up and we're gonna check out the games. I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Wonders of the First. Wonders of the First is a brand new collectible card game similar to games like Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon, featuring a unique action-based resource economy that helps avoid pitfalls like Mana Flood or Mana Screw, and a battlefield containing multiple realms that unlock over time as you fight for control of the stones. The first 400 card set is called Existence and will launch to retail in the fall, but playtest team starter kits are available to order now. And they haven't forgotten about all you collectors out there. The game contains alternate borderless art variants, as well as highly sought after limited edition numbered prints, culminating in a one of one stone foil. And the best part is that the developers have a community first approach, with eight print and play decks available on their website, as well as a version of the game available on Tabletop Simulator, all for free. For more information, be sure to check out WondersCCG.com today. That's Wonders ccg.com This looks pretty good. We'll keep this. We'll start with the courtyard. Play the case. We named Cleric with Cavern of Souls. We can play both Hinterland Sanctifiers. Which kind of seems good. He's going to take the Sheltered, right? Yeah, he has to. We are in a rough spot. Cleric. Try and pad out our life total here. <coughs> Try and take his eye off the ball a bit. We need him to tap out so we can safely cast Essence Channeler. Oh, he used the cut down. Oh, he's using both of them. That's actually good for us. I think we just play the Essence Channeler. It would have been nice to get the Ellis out first, but we would have missed the life gain from the, the Barons, and we wouldn't have had a good blocker this turn. This way we prevent the C-Note Scout from swinging in. <coughs> Angel wants me to give Bandit a hug. I mean, 
At least he's kind of stuck on lands, right? It's not the worst ever. Oh boy. Courtyard. Ailey. Pass the turn. I think we have to block with Ellis and then sack Ellis to Ailey. Which I really don't love. But he gets to destroy our case if we don't. <coughs> well, that works. Do we hit the deep cavern bat or do we hit the glissa? Because glissa can destroy the sheltered by ghosts. If we hit the deep cavern bat. Which is kind of a problem. But I mean, even if he does, then we just play the other one, right? I think that's okay. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. We basically, like, stall him. For a little bit. Unless he kills it, leaves the two mana open, and immediately casts the Deep Cavern Bat, right? Oh no, it's when it enters. It doesn't go back to his hand, it comes back into play. What am I thinking? Clearly I was sick for too many days. Yeah. Yeah, I should have just killed Glisso. I'm a dummy. I'm a dummy. It's true. No attacks. In the turn. So now we block Glissa with Enduring Tenacity. And then sacrifice it to Ailey to gain 3 life. Making him lose 3 life in the process. And then we still have our Enduring Tenacity ability. And then we just have to get really, really lucky. With our top deck. Uh, that qualifies. Although we're not going to be able to get back the sheltered by ghosts yet. It's either Essence Channeler or Ellis. I think Essence Channeler. Alright. Not too shabby. 
No attacks. We need to chump block Glissa with Ailey. Because we can bring Ailey back. We can't bring Essence Channeler back. And we need Zoraline to bring something back. Can't have you destroying my enchantments, so. <coughs> Here we go. Get the triggers. Auto pay. Now we get back the sheltered by ghosts. Which goes on the essence channeler. And then we hit the deep cavern bat. Pay the one. Get back a sheltered by ghost for next turn. Now we have blockers. We just gotta ride Zoraline to victory. So we chump block Glissa with Ellis so that he can't kill our sheltered by ghosts. We take six from the C note scout. For now. It's fine. Everything is fine. Well, we can't play Enduring Innocence and Sheltered by Ghosts, which is kind of a bummer. We need to get rid of that Glisso. the vigilance before we swing but we're getting the life gain so I gotta hope that that's enough and we'll get back I want to get back a blocker right just in case we need a blocker <clears throat> for that big c-note scout But we gain a whole bunch of life with these guys. Oh, and then we kill them with tenacity. Because of all the life linking from Sheltered by Ghosts. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. The lands look a little rough. I think we can make it work, though. Start with the Scoured Barons. And we're going to have to get a creature down. It's probably going to shock it, right? <clears throat> I assume he nukes it with like a lightning helix or something. No, slick shot. Alright, I mean that's great for us. That is absolutely great for us. Play a case. Swing two. Just keep gaining life to stay ahead of his, his buffs and we should be fine. sheltered by ghosts. Interesting play. <clears throat> I approve. 
not approve. Ow. That was mean. Get rid of the sheltered by ghosts. Get some more life gain triggers. Wonderful. Swing for three. Gain three more life. Make you even bigger. End the turn. Solve the case. We could have played the other case. I like holding up the joust through. with the joust through unfortunately unfortunately but we're gaining enough life it kind of doesn't matter kind of doesn't matter during innocence deep cavern bat so many options <clears throat> I mean getting out the enduring innocence is better for certain things. I think we'll just play the bat, though. I think we just win quicker if we just play the bat. Son of a it has vigilance when we take damage, right? Yeah. And the turn. It's two solved case of the uneaten feast. I don't think there's anything you can do. Yes, brownie man, we are we are black and white. You can have your demonic ruck ruckus back, that's fine. Just gotta be safe. Uh. Hmm. Hmm. We could crack a case. Hit something in his hand with the deep cavern bat. I think I want to just do this. Bandit, what are you chewing on? Bandit, what are you chewing on? No. Dogs, man! Dogs! We'll just swing with Ellis. Gain some life. And the turn. Hold up the joust through. <coughs> I want him to use a buff spell on the heart fire hero. So I can joust through in response. Nope. Just gonna turn inside out, I guess. Okay. Well, we get some life gain triggers. Get a nine. 
You are pretty out of luck, my friend. Get all the triggers. Draw all the cards. Take all the things. Goodbye. All right, I'm going to keep seven. We'll start with the caves. Play a case. Mud Flat Village. We'll play Ellis. <coughs> I think we want to play Scoured Barons next turn. So that we can play Alenda on turn four. So we'll go with Ailey. Ailey is so good. She's so good. Gain the life. Swing for two. Removal? I'll trade with your fairy. Awesome. I got to gain my life point from Ailey off of it and kill your fairy? That sounds glorious. Do you have a counter spell? Am I about to get sad? Probably. Probably about to get sad. Okay, just gonna kill that guy. That's fine. What's cool is it's not just hexproof on my turn, it's hexproof from instance. So even if he has instant speed removal that he wants to cast on his turn at sorcery speed, Still can't target Alenda. Which is awesome because everybody's trying to use as much instant speed removal these days as possible because of, uh, you know, mono red prowess decks and stuff. So it completely works against that. It's amazing. It's amazing. Alright, so first we're gonna play you. Then we're gonna play you. See what's in that hand. Doomsday Excruciator. Not happy about that. Doomsday Excruciator. Do it. Do it. <clears throat> I got a menace life linker. <clears throat> That's you can't target. You're just gonna mill yourself, bro. <clears throat> You're just gonna mill yourself. And I'm fine with that. Give me all the triggers. Give me that last card in your hand. Goodbye, Jace. 
And now I will watch you. <clears throat> Mill yourself out. Yes. Draw your cards. Draw all your cards, sir. Aw, oh, did you just draw removal for the bat? You son of a bitch. You son of a bitch. Well, we almost had him, boys. One turn away. One time. Alright, this actually looks pretty good. We're gonna keep it. We're gonna play the Sanctifier on one. Hopeless Nightmare. I don't know what to get rid of. Honestly. If he's playing a discard deck... <coughs> maybe the Sheltered by Ghosts. I think the rest of our curve is really good. And, uh... He's going to mostly be playing things that make us discard. We're not going to really have anything to hit with it. I think it's better to just try to get as much of a tempo advantage as possible. Get on the board. Draw draw cards off of Innocence, hopefully. If we have to discard again, we'll get rid of the Thrawn portal for sure. It's going to take Ellis, right? So we have nothing to play next turn. Oh no, he took our card draw. Okay. Well, we'll play Hellas. That's fine. We'll attack for one. I'm gonna assume he doesn't have a second bat. It's very unlikely. And all of his other discard probably isn't going to let him look at our hand and choose a card. So I think Amalia will be safe for one turn. We have we have lands we don't mind discarding at this point if he hits us with, you know, discard where we choose, like Hopeless Nightmare. So I'm not worried about that. If I was worried about Amalia, I would have played the Amalia out this turn instead. Bandit, stop snoring. You're so loud. You're so loud. All right, we're going to go uh, white here. We're going to play Amalia. Try and get some triggers. Would you like to kill Amalia? Sir? You would like to kill, kill Amalia, that's fine. It's actually better that that happens now, because we have a Lenda coming next turn. And if we can stick a Lenda, oh boy. Actually, he wouldn't be able to target a Lenda with Shoot Sheriff anyway. So it doesn't even matter. Let's hope he doesn't have Sorcery Speed removal. And then he gets really sad. We'll see what happens. If you've only got instants, you're in for a world of hurt, my friend. Bandy. Snoring really loud, buddy. It's going right into my microphone. Oh, 
Hi, Bo. All the puppers are coming out to play. They're like, stop streaming and come play with us. I know, Bo. I know. A hinterland sanctifier. Well, let's gain some life. We can get back the Amalia. Oh no, we can't. We can't get back. Amalia. I'm a liar. Pay no, pay no attention to me. Ooh. Gain some more life. Blenda becomes a five-five. Lose another life to Phyrexian Arena. Oh, you have a fell. What are the chances? Oh, you lucky duck. Nobody plays with Fell. Of course, this dude's got a Fell because I'm playing Alenda. It's okay, though. It's okay. Let's get in for some damage. The cool thing here is if he kills the channeler, we get the counters, and then we just get it back with the Mudflat Village. Which is kind of amazing. Come on. <clears throat> Nobody knows Dominaria shadows like me. Target player sacks a creature. Problem is we need to top deck a land in order to do it this turn, right? So I think we do get rid of the Sanctifier here. Plus we can always just bring back the Sanctifier with the Mudflat Village if we're desperate. So it's not the worst thing ever. We just don't get the extra value of uh, getting to move the counters. What else you got? Swings for one, goes up to four. All right, we're gonna tap that for a mana just to turn on flying. Can we kill him and Liliana? Or do you have a cut down? I mean, cut down won't kill the channeler, so I think we're good. That Thrawn portal saved our butts. Well, we had Caves of Coilo, so it wouldn't have mattered, but. Nice. Oh, nice. Now I can take the boys outside. This looks great. We'll keep this. Start with the courtyard and the sanctifier. Go straight into the channeler. Hopefully we can draw a three drop in the next two draws. Duress hits nothing, which is awesome. And then we draw the thing that the duress could have hit. That's kind of hilarious. All right, swing with the sanctifier. <coughs> We've definitely got the tempo advantage right now. Persistence. We get to put the counter on the Sanctifier, which is nice. Don't really have anything to play, which is a huge bummer. We could sack the Mudflat Village and get back the Channeler. That's so bad, though. We have three four drops in our hand. We need to get to our fourth land. So we're just going to swing. And we're going to hope that he starts to try to play out some board presence. But he doesn't. That's a bummer. I don't think he wants to waste removal on the Sanctifier. So he's just like holding on to it. Which I mean, it's fine by me. End the turn. Union of the third path, sure. So Alenda is safe from instance. Which is kind of amazing. So we're just gonna play her. Tenacity would have been a good play too, because if he has removal, it just comes back. 
but I think Alenda being safe from instance is probably the number one play. I don't know if he has any removal in the whole deck that can deal with Alenda. He probably has mostly instant speed removal, and as far as sorcery speed removal, we've already seen Virtue of Persistence. Okay, he's got Day of Judgment. That's, that's something. That is something. We absolutely need to play Ellis so that we can get our card draw trigger off of Exemplar. Um, let's play the Exemplar. Mmm, he could play the Conqueror next turn and just kill us, right? Alright, we're gonna do it like this. Joust through. We don't need that right now. Sheltered by ghosts. Hit the tenacity. That way if he has the conqueror next turn, it's not an auto win. Uh, we're going to keep the enduring instance on top. That gives us options. <coughs> Day of judgment again. It is what it is. That's two Day of Judgments gone, though, so... It's something, at least. Um... I'm so worried about him having the Bloodthirsty Conqueror. So we're gonna do this again. Even though he almost definitely has removal for this. Liliana, make a sacrifice. Let us march into battle and make new Get it back, but he gets his back too. Do we need to sack one of these mudflat villages? Alright, if we go to sack it. We're not going to have enough mana to play it and play something else if we do that. So I don't think that's great. Let's just do this. Just try and flood the board. And hope that since we made him use two back-to-back -back sweepers, he doesn't have any more. Damn it. Dude, this is so over. This is very bad. At least we get to draw a card off the exemplar. Oh, it's a land. And it's another land! Oh, come on! Not like this. Not like this. Not like this. Alright, we're gonna try and draw something. Oh, so bad. So bad. Yeah, we're just dead. That's awful. Oh, I can't believe it. He pulled the combo off on us. He just, he had a lot of control. We couldn't keep anything on the board. Honestly, he had two back-to-back -back Day of Judgments, uh, and that was very unlikely. That that gave him a huge advantage. He had, he had luck on his side, for sure. Alright, this looks pretty good. We can keep this. We'll start with a turn one Case of the Uneaten Feast. Uh, probably go right into a Deep Cavern Bat. Probably won't start with the Essence Channeler. We are going to lose that uh, that one life gain trigger on the Channeler by not playing it on two. Uh, but I think it's probably more important to make sure we get whatever removal they have out of their hand. 
if if they have him. It also gives us an attacker quicker that can get us more life gain triggers over the course of the game, so I think ultimately it's the right play. Alright. Swings. We're gonna play the mud flat village here. And use it to play the, the bat. Get a little bit of life. Take something out of his hand. Uh oh boy. Oh boy. Do we force him to use the sheltered by ghosts on our deep cavern bat? I think so. I think so. I think that's just better. He does get the option of hitting our head with the lightning strike when he gets it back. But we want him to have to kill our essence channelers, not exile them. That way we potentially get to move the counters onto like another deep cavern bat. being said, we'll just take the lightning strike here. Now, we are going to be climbing uphill a little bit because he's got that lifelink, but I think we've mostly run him out of gas, and we should be fine to just start getting all our life back, getting all that value. We shall see. Is he going to kill the bat? I I'm assuming no, because we get back another bat. Yeah. Let's see, do we play Ellis? Or do we just play both Essence Channelers? I think we just play both Essence Channelers. That gives us two big creatures. Very big creatures, right? And they get to move their counters when they die, so... It's actually pretty strong. Especially with him being very out of gas. Lizard, Mouse, Otter, Raccoon. He can get the uh, plus one, plus one counters on the heart fire hero. That's about it. It's going to be really hard for him, yeah, to effectively attack. You do it like this. Now he has a really hard decision to make. He could kill one of our essence channelers and we get to move the counter onto the deep cavern bat. Or he could kill the deep cavern bat and get the lightning strike back. Or he could put us at two. But he can't do all of those things. get the life gain triggers first. Now things are about to get real crazy. We'll take a point of damage to turn on Vigilance and Flying. That way we get to keep it as a blocker. And we'll scoured barons. Yeah. Even at 29 life, that's it, buddy. Alright, this actually looks pretty good. 
We have two caves of Koilos, so we're going to be paddling upstream a little bit when it comes to getting to a higher life total for Ailey. But that's okay. That's okay. Turn one case of the Uneaten Feast. My doggo is snoring. Bandy boy, you comfy? I love you. Alright, we're going to Mudflat Village. Trying to think. Do we take a chance? I think we just play out the Ellis. <clears throat> Alright, we bait out the Torch the Tower, that's fine. That was what I was worried about, which is why I didn't want to play the Deep Cavern Bat. We'll wait until he's tapped out to play the Bat. And then we should be good. Um, we are going to play Enduring Innocence this turn, though. Just to most effectively use our mana. That lets us play the Bat and Ailey next turn and draw a card off of Enduring Innocence. Which should be pretty good. Well, let's, let's play the Bat first and see what we draw. And then decide what to do. Oh, God. He's got forges. I think we can outpace the forges. <clears throat> Do we want to save Ailey to draw another card off of Enduring Innocence? I think probably. I think we get the Restless Fortress out. I don't think rushing to get Ailey down is going to do a whole lot for us right now. Could block. Kinda like that, honestly. Because we want to try to get our life total to 30 for Ailey if we can. And we're not gonna have an opportunity to swing in with it very effectively because he's got that damn rabbit. So we'll go case. Tenacity. We won't be drawing a card this turn. But uh we will be getting the most the most mana efficient plays possible. And have a decent blocker for the, the forge token this turn. Man, Bandit, you really are snoring up a storm over there. He's comfy. He's happy. Doesn't really matter if the tenacity dies. Oh, I guess it does. I guess his exile overwrites our exile? That's fine, though. We're gonna have so much life, it's going to be glorious. Absolutely glorious. Triggers. Scoured Barons. We are so close. We are so close. Alright, we're at 30. <coughs> Solve the cases. Which means when these things die, we can just replay them. We need to stay at 30. So we can use Ailey to destroy the forge. But we also need something to sacrifice to Ailey to destroy the forge. Right? Which is tricky. Oh, Sunfall! Bummer 
that we couldn't sack Ailey to herself. That's okay. That's okay. We'll make it work. Wish we had just one more creature in the yard. I really don't want to sacrifice a case just to play one creature, you know? There we go. Draw, trigger, trigger. You need another creature to sack to Ailey to kill the forge. <coughs> See what he's got in his hand. That's a lot of removal. Holy shit. Holy moly. Holy moly. I think... I think we have to try to force him... We want to try to force him to use his get lost. We, we can't really because he has two of both removal spells. Which is kind of fucking insane. <laughs> but I mean, he kills everything. We crack a case next turn and get it all back. So it's, it's actually not that bad. And we're not in a super rush to kill the forge. We just need to eventually... Alright, gets rid of the innocence, that's fine. And we definitely need to get all of that removal out of his hand. Three, four, five, six, seven. No blocks. We need to try to like replay everything next turn. If we can. There's a Thrawn portal. Okay, so. Back the case. <clears throat> We're gonna go. Uh. Since first we draw a card off Ellis. Yeah. Try to hit a land and then play Ailey with the land that we hit. Nope, just a joust through. Just a joust through. I think we actually hold on to the joust through. We could map token here. Requiring him to kick a burst lightning. If he wants to kill our Ellis. That could be smart. You know what, maybe that's actually better. Another case is probably a good idea, since we're probably going to uh, <coughs> eat through our cases pretty quickly here. Alright, so we can't play Ailey, that's fine. If he wants to kill Ellis, he has to kick the burst lightning, which he probably just won't bother to do. I mean, we outpace his damage. We don't mind just taking the damage, forcing him to have to use up all of his removal if he wants to get our creatures gone. God damn it. 
I hate that card so much. I've been harping about it for like three years now. But Exile and Sweeper do not go together. It's too much for one card to do. Way too much. Way, way, way too much. Like, way, way, way too much. We'll drain. We'll hit. We'll end the turn. Like, eventually, this Joust through is going to fog a big Urbrask's Forge token and gain us a life, which will be nice. So we're holding on to it. But man, he's got so much card advantage with those Caretaker's talents. I hate Sunfall so much. I cannot explain with words how trash I think the concept of a card that can do that much by itself is. No card should do that much on its own. I hated the concept when Farewell was around. I hated it when it was, you know, 8 mana Ugin. Every single card that's been able to sweep and exile at the same time has been stupid and not good for the game. Sweepers are difficult enough to deal with. But they create an interesting play pattern where you have to kind of, you know, <clears throat> dance with the opponent and play around the sweeper. But tacking exile onto a sweeper just takes away way too many silver lining synergies uh, and puts it way over the top. Just way, way, way over the top. Sheltered by ghosts. <coughs> that would be nice. Three, six. Ah, he didn't double block. He didn't double block the fool. The fool. All right, we got rid of one of the six ones. Gained a point of life back. We've got one case that we can crack. gonna have to I don't think he can kill the land now that it's got the counters we're so close to stabilizing so so close Freaking third caretaker's talent, that was insane. Absolutely insane. You didn't attack? is so weird. <clears throat> he could have actually killed me that turn, I'm pretty sure. 
He was swinging for 20 and he had four points of direct damage in his hand. to reset the the forge <clears throat> even if we can't keep it gone forever because the fortress will go away we got to reset it we got to gain some life back and we got to force him to trade dudes still blocks with the six one anyway because he wants it to die uh I don't think I'm ready to crack that case yet Maybe I should have. I could have blocked the 7-1. Bought myself a lot more time. <clears throat> but I only have Ailey to get back. It seems like kind of a waste. And with him having so many cards in hand, I think we need to get the absolute most value as possible out of each card. To even have a chance. Chances are going to be slim either way. But I think if we have any chance of coming back, it's getting the most value out of these cases as possible. Which Sunfall just absolutely destroys. Which kind of sucks. Oh, that might actually be enough. Now that he leveled up a caretaker's talent. Is that enough? I think he's like three damage short of killing me. Yeah. Brutal. Brutal. I kinda hate that there's nothing new and interesting in this deck. Like, sure, he added burst lightnings. But that's it. And it makes me sad. Enduring Innocence. So, we play Enduring Innocence. Get some life gain triggers. We crack a case. Play the Ailey. Draw a card. <coughs> Play Amalia. Uh, put you in the graveyard for the other case. Eventually. I think it's enough to survive an extra turn. But it's it's not great. It's not great. It's not great. <coughs> Brotherhood's end. that gain life hopefully get a counter on Amalia yes put an essence channel in the yard so Amalia will survive still won't be enough will it no still won't be enough we tried though
Oof. <coughs> Good game, my friend. That was wild. Thanks so much for checking out my channel. I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons over at Patreon. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. So honestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your contributions. If you haven't yet, like and subscribe. The more likes we get and the quicker we get them, the bigger this channel will grow and the faster it will grow. I'd love nothing more than this channel to become something very special for you guys, but it's entirely up to you how fast that happens. Also, if you'd like more deck text, that's somewhere over there and if you'd like to see what else the channel's been up to lately that's somewhere up that way also subscribe circle below do all the things